Boardroom Bound, Episode 37, How to Recognize a Successful Advisory Board with Rudy Scheiber-Kurtz. We talk a lot about working on the business, meaning really the strategic initiative that you should have. You should have goals and objectives and where you want to be in three years, and most importantly, how you're going to get there. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Boardroom Bound. My name is Alexander Lowry, and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership in the boardroom. My goal is to give new and aspiring directors the tips, tactics, and strategies necessary to transform your confidence and build a successful career as a board director. Quick reminder, you can get all of today's show notes at podcast.gordon.edu. In today's show, we'll be speaking with Rudy Scheiber-Kurtz, who is a serial entrepreneur and innovator and a founder of three companies specializing in finance leadership. She offers leadership, knowledge, and insights as a board member and business advisor. She designed and developed CEO workshops, CEO case studies, and a video series for middle market companies. And she has a newly published book called Stop Compromising that reflects her years of work with small and middle market companies. And we actually have a special value option today for all of our listeners to get their hands on that book. Quick special announcement that I'm very excited to be a speaker at the National Associated Corporate Directors Annual Forum in Washington, D.C. in September. Now, the Global Board Leader Summit is the largest and most influential director forum in the world. It's going to attract about 1,800 directors from across the globe. This is where the greatest minds in governance convene to take on the most important issues facing today's boardrooms and collectively discover the future of exemplary board leadership. I'm thrilled that the Boardroom Bound podcast is a part of it because we're actually recording a podcast episode live. So for any of you who are in attendance, you're listening to the show, I am so excited to meet you in person, and we will be recording an episode Monday morning. Hope to see many of you there. In today's episode, we're going to be talking with Rudy all about advisory boards. On this show, we often talk about boards of directors, and those are the typical role that people in this audience are looking for, but they're not the right role for everybody, nor are they something you can often jump directly to. Most people will tend to take a path to get there. For some people, they'll join a nonprofit board. Other people will take an advisory board role first to get the background, the skills, the experience, and the networking, and then transition over. Perhaps their goal is being on a public company board of directors. Rudy specializes in advisory boards. That's where she likes to play. That's where her space is. That's where her jam is. And she's going to talk all about those today, the differences between them and regular boards, but also the skill and the networking expertise you need to make that happen and build a successful career in that space. And she's done very well in that for herself. Really excited to share her story and the perspective of how she's grown into that role. Let's jump into the show. Well, Rudy Scheiber-Kurtz, welcome to the Boardroom Bound podcast. Thank you so much, Alexander, for having me. I'm delighted to be here. And I'm thrilled that we're actually live in this studio today. We don't get to do that too often, especially when you and I started this conversation a while ago. So I'm glad it came together. We had to postpone it from your, your Iceland trip was in the way before us, but you're back. We had a great time. And now we're ready to talk about boards today. That's right. And I know that for me, one of the exciting parts today is we will do a deep dive differentiating between what most of us think about for boards in terms of boards of director versus advisory board, which is not something we often talk about for the distinction here. But I think for a lot of our audience, that is actually maybe the easiest way for some of them to start. You think about um, startup companies, for example, so many of them and advisory boards are where they start. But maybe you can give us a primer in the beginning of how you distinguish between those two types of boards. Okay. So <clears throat> I think it's important to to do understand the difference. Um, uh, a board of directors is mandated when you're a public company and they they have a responsibility around governance of that company. They can, in fact, fire the CEO and they also have a responsibility to shareholders. On an advisory board, you really want to bring your strategic thinking and understanding of the marketplace to the place, to, to the company. Um, and help the CEOs start thinking more forward. Where do they want to be in the next three years, et cetera, and how are they going to get there? What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? And that's an advisory board. And I will just give some personal flavor for myself. So I'm probably on five of those with startup companies I'm really excited about, Uh, one of which has a very strong CEO. He's a visionary. He's got tons of great ideas. And for his advisory board, 
it's often a sounding board for him. He, he doesn't necessarily take a lot of our feedback and guidance. And I think there's sometimes there's grumblings among ourselves of, well, how much should we be giving him if he's not really listening? Is that typical? What is your experience on that? And, and how do you overcome something like that? That is typical. Now, my um, background is that I work with lower middle market companies. I've also worked worked with startups, and certainly my own business started as a startup sure. where I had an advisory board. <clears throat> and they um, helped me really sort of visualizing and figuring out how to get to the next next level of my company. But the work that I have been doing as uh, really CFO to lower middle markets are companies between 10 to 150 million in annual sales. They have very specific issues. They're mostly uh, business owners, founders. Mm -hmm. They've brought it all the way up there, and now what? Right. right? They often are stuck. They don't know how to get to the next stage. And an advisory board for them is a very important next step. So let's think this through because we know most startups aren't successful. It's just the way of the tough business world. But if you've been successful to grow to that sort of level, some things have gone really well. You've probably developed repeatable processes. You found your niche. You've done your market. And what is the typical situation? Is it the founder thinking about how do I pass this to the next generation or how do I grow to the next level? What's what's the conundrum where they're usually thinking, great, now I need that advisor? Yeah, great questions. It's really all of the above. <laughs> and it, it all, all depends a little bit in how – the advisory board is used, how the business owner views it, how what they want to get out of, uh, what they're looking for. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I think there there's a lot of leeway, and I have a lot of uh, recommendations and <laughs> how to think about it for, for the business owner because that's important. There are some advisory boards out there that are really not effective, and that ends up being a waste of money and time. Well, you can think about it from a CEO who's successfully grown their business, have certain key skills have allowed them to do that. Maybe they've never had to pick out an advisory board before, and it can be a hard thing to figure out finding someone who's more experienced and a specialist in an area than you are. So uh, maybe we'd, let me we'd talk to some of the aspiring directors in the audience thinking, how would you go through that conversation with CEO to help them understand that you're the right person for them? How, how do you do that personally? So I think <clears throat> from my experience, again, in working with the lower middle uh, the, the lower middle market is that um, they often are still completely consumed in working in the business. Mm -hmm. So we talk a lot about working on the business, meaning really the strategic initiative that you should have. You should have goals and objectives and where you want to be in three years. And most importantly, how are you going to get there? Now, finding that time for the business owner in that space is very hard. So I call them really the CEO uh, with the hair on fire. <laughs> They're constantly called back into the business to solve problems, to, to uh, yeah, I mean, they're ongoing problem solver. <clears throat> so an advisory board should have the purpose of taking that business owner out of the business, sit down and say, okay, so let's start focusing where you're going to take your business. Because really, if you don't have a path, if you don't have a roadmap, you're not going to end up where you want to end up. That's a very important piece. So an advisory board should then also be there to help the CEO think in that way and all the pieces that need to fall in place to do the growth, to do the transition or the sale. And so that you end up with a legacy piece that you can live with, that you can be happy with. You, right. you put all your time and money into this business to bring it to 80 million in annual sales, and yet you don't know where you're going. You can lose that money in a very short time, and mm -hmm. you don't want to do that. And so let me translate that into one of my own examples where I'm on the advisory board of my job is to bring big picture thinking for these individuals of, you know, my background in fintech for this fintech company of here are the type of people you would connect with. Here's where you'd fit into the space. Here's where the ecosystem is going so they can continue driving the business forward. But some of that direction insight. So then 
as, as our audience is new and aspiring directors thinking about this, help us understand these are the sort of the qualities and characteristics of someone who has been there and done it before. This is not someone who's for the first time trying to put themselves seniority. Can you help us understand that? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's actually a, a very important piece as well. You, you take the business owner. Again, they're in their business all the time. And they see things or they don't see things. Whereas when you bring in advisors who've done it over and over again, have worked with multiple companies, they start seeing patterns. They know how to attack those issues. They know when they come up or see the red flags, so to speak. They can help you with all of that. And they see things that you may not necessarily see because you're so your time is so taken by constantly running the business. Right. So um, you, you get blindsided. And so that's going to tie in with what we talk a lot on the show about the personal branding and know your specialist expertise, where you're an authority. So you're not a generalist who knows lots of things. They're putting you on the board because maybe they want the industry expertise or the functional expertise. So for example, I'm looking at, at your book that we've got in front of us called Stop Compromising, the CEO's Guide to Building Value Through Smarter Finance. So clearly part of your brand is I'm bringing that expertise about how to better run the financials behind your companies. Is that how you're typically brought onto these roles? That is often how I'm being brought on board, <clears throat> but also for the expertise. But one of the things when we're talking about sort of essential board member skills that w a, an advisor should bring to the table, in my experience, what I have found is that there is a tendency that you want experts, right? And you want to have a collection of experts, and then they all come together and they talk about their expertise. <laughs> but what so often doesn't happen is that there, and if it's not the business owner and CEO who can connect the dots back to finance, back to resources, to people within that company, no one else is going to do that. And that is something I talk about to CEOs and business owners. That's something I always have brought to the table. I can understand in looking at a company holistically because every decision you make has financial ramifications, mm -hmm. has HR ramifications, has market ramifications. Right. Someone has to put those dots together for you okay. or with you. And that is something... <clears throat> so what I call that the 360 degree view mm -hmm. of a business. You want to have at least one or two advisory board members that you can figure out that they have that ability to bring that to the table. Very important because you, <clears throat> you don't want to make decisions that leave certain parts of your business out, right? right? Everything is affected by your decision. Yeah. And you have to understand how so that you make the optimal move. Okay. Now, this is great because when we think about uh, someone who's starting a business, they're going to probably be a specialist in one or two or maybe three things, but a generalist in the rest. So they're needing people to give them that advice and coaching to bring it back, which is exactly why you have a board of advisors to help you do that. For the people listening to this podcast, some of whom are thinking, great, I want to grow up to be that, to be able to do what Rudy's doing now and do that. Can you give us the evolution of how you got into this and how it started for you? Clearly, you've got a great elevator pitch now, but that, that grew over time. Um, <clears throat> I would think that really actually happened naturally. Um, okay. I, I wasn't out there saying, I want to be on board. Mm. So this happened years and years ago, um, and it happened... Um, as way back as being uh, working at WGBH as a business manager in a nonprofit, I had six million dollar budget. I had a mandate that I needed to turn that department around. Mm. Uh, they continuously lost money there, so um, and I did. I turned that department around in one year with a whole bunch of analysis and working with the CFO there. That got me a board position for a nonprofit. Um, <coughs> and and did they find you or did you find them? But they found me. Okay, based on the <laughs> reputation you'd built, right. which we talked about with branding. Okay. Right, with someone that you work with and they make a recommendation. But also, I think the exciting part for me is um, that the Simmons School of Management, where I got my MBA uh, over 20 years ago now, um, they started an entrepreneurship program 
and I got very excited about that and got involved there. And we felt that it was very important for the entrepreneurship program to succeed that we would have an advisory board. And the advisory board would be, the purpose would be to bring business and academia together and for the students to truly understand what is needed and all pieces that you need in, in order to start a business. So they came to me and said, Rudy, you're so connected. Can you start an advisory board? That's how I got on that one. Um, brought in venture capitalists, angel investors, lawyers, accountants, coaches. We were a fantastic board. We were very successful there. And so the dean of the business school at that time said, I want one of those boards too. I can see where this is going. Okay. <laughs> So she started uh, an, a business advisory board to the dean of the business school. And I joined that a little later on because <clears throat> I was there to represent the entrepreneurship program. And uh, I'm still on that business advisory council um, today. <clears throat> then also work around merger and acquisitions that I've done through our CFO services at Next Stage Solutions. Um, I joined an organization called XBX New England. Uh, there I was recruited to be on the board. And then the last two years I was the president of that organization. And I'm now the past president um, and will stay on for a couple of years to support the current one. But the idea there is that it's just sort of evolved and I love board work. Um, then in between all that time, I also, through Next Stage Solutions, started my own CEO workshops. So that's almost like advisory, right? right? I would create typical challenges that I knew these companies had and say, okay, we're gonna do a workshop. Wanna come, show up, I'll bring a bunch of experts and we'll discuss it. That became very successful as well and ended up really being um, a tremendous source for deal flow mm -hmm. because that sometimes would take two, three years for a CEO and say, oh, I remember at Rudy's workshop and they give me a phone call when they needed help. So those CEO workshops uh, were specific to CEOs, again, in the lower middle market and smaller companies. And then I also did live um, case studies where I worked with CEOs to be very specific in what challenges they're facing. Then I would bring an advisory board, sort of an, an, an official advisory board that would work towards that challenge and come up with ideas. Then we'd have an official workshop and discuss it. And the feedback from the CEOs was always that I've never had that before, where I could have so many experts in the room talking about my challenge and mm. coming up with ideas. So um, so that all sort of feeds into this role of, of helping business owners think about next step and next phases for their business and their, you know, their personal life, too, if they and, want to sell the company. And it's, it sounds almost, I'm going to use the word easy now, to talk about this as what comes together as a story. But from what I'm hearing, these were sort of stepping stones along the way, not all in the same direction, but we right. can look back now and see they're easily part of the story. Uh, but from if we can also break it down for audience, I'm hearing more typical type board roles in some of your background, whereas now you've, you've pivoted and you've focused almost exclusively, it sounds like, on the advisory board. Can you talk us through, in your mind, where you realized, well, this is where I should be focusing since so it's the right fit for me? Because I think that'll help some of our audience members. So typically what skill set they should bring or or well what? as you thought about which was the right fit for you in terms of say a typical board of directors versus an advisory board well i am one of those weird people who absolutely loves challenges and always wants to find the opportunity in the challenge and working with the ceos uh who were my clients or now as you know i'm their advisor i love being their sounding board. Um, I love problem solving together with them to find the best solution for their next step. Does that answer the question? It does, it does. <laughs> so I think for our audience out there, as you're envisioning, you know, there are nonprofits and there's 
profit company boards, and for profit company boards, there's advisory, there's normal full boards of directors. You're trying to figure out where your niche fits, what you enjoy challenging yourself on, what the types of problems you want to solve, the conversations you want to have, the organizational flow you work through. And it sounds like, if tell me if this is right, Rudy, it's yours evolved over time. As you tried different things, you realized those are good, but these are better. Right, okay. right. Yeah, I, I would certainly say so. And also, you know, when you... Over, over time, when we work in, in our professions, we find what we really love doing right. and w- what, what we love doing somewhat. Uh, but this kind of work is where I have just tremendous passion. I just love finding solutions with the CEO and business owner. And I will hearken back to an episode where Doug McGray was talking about how you want to go where your passion fits because you're going to bring your best self mm-hmm. to the boardroom, which not only means you'll do well for the people you're working with, but it'll do well for your reputation just in general as it's grown. It sounds like right. you found that niche and you can hear the energy that you've got right, behind it. Right, right. And partly also why I wrote the book, because the patterns you were exposed to over the years and so many CEOs, again, business owners, they work so hard in building that company, yet they leave so much money on the table. And it's not that hard to fix that. And for us, it would, not saying it's always easy, but you know, as I talked about the red flags before, you go in and say, aha, that's this, yeah, mm, okay, over here. We need to get you know the finance in, in shape. We need to do a, margin a profit margin analysis so that you understand better what what actually where you make your profits right. uh, stuff like that but um for 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 them to you know to take the time and then they lose and leave so much money on the table it's just i i said i have to write a book for them so that they can open it up and follow it step by step in how to create value for their business and that's how, how I wrote it. It was relatively easy with all my experiences over the years that I let Next Stage Solutions. And I was trying to think about how to describe it. So I'm a professor of finance, so I'm biased. I found it easily readable, but I, you didn't write it for someone like me. You wrote it for some CEOs who perhaps aren't finance people so that they could also digest it. Exactly. And you'd be amazed how many people bundle accounting and finance together. So my first chapters are just about that, that... Um, And again, uh, my experience in working with lower middle market companies, they view finance as accounting. I have a CPA, I have an accountant, I have a controller, I'm all set. And by the way, if they have a CFO, it's very often what we call sort of a glorified controller. So the mindset is missing, the strategic Mm. mindset is missing, and it's a missing piece. And I would get questions from CEOs and say, I don't know what the expectation should be. Tell me about it. And for the listeners, I think an easy way to think about accounting are your taillights of a car. Mm. And finance are your headlights. Where you're going. You've got to know mm. where you're going. And if not, you're going to have a crash. That's a great analogy. But that's just the way it is. I'm going to start using it. I'm going to steal that. I'll quote you that. Okay, I'll see where fine. I got it. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let's think about it this way. So you've given us a wonderful perspective of your own personal brand and your history. And we know where you're targeting now on the lower middle market companies for advisory boards. Many of our listeners are thinking, great, I, I might want to do this myself. Can you walk us through what a Rudy example would be about how you're going and, and finding the opportunities and making the pitch to to find the right roles for you to join in terms of advisory boards? That sounds great. I think there is not a lot of material out there to start out with. There are not a lot of groups that you can just call on and say, okay, you know, help me with this. So I would like to start with the idea of advice to the business owner. How should mm. you, the business owner, think about this? Of, And why should you have an advisory board, right? So I'd say think about an advisory board as an investment. Um, if for the really for the future of your company that investment if you bring the right advisors on board uh can bring you an roi of 10 20 fold right so it, it or more it's uh it's that rich it's that important um and you want it 
sort of think about yourself. How much time do you give really for thinking about the business, where it's going to be in three years? Where do you want to be in three years? Or do you even know where you should be? Yeah, or are you tired? Uh, Don't wait until you're exhausted and, you know, you're retiring age, and then you want to do this. Do this now. Build value now. Um, so it's it, it's a process, and it's it's planning. You have to plan for this. Um, so the big question is always, well, how do I find the right advisor? I can tell you whom not to ask. <laughs> That's good. Um, don't ask your lawyer. Yeah. Don't ask your accountant. Don't ask your friend. Peter Hershend, who was on a previous episode, also the same. You need a lawyer, but you don't want them on your board. Right. So that's the first advice. And then I would say um, there are some businesses out there that can help you build an advisory board. And certainly I do this uh, with Next Stage Solutions. Um, so you can, you can hire a company to do this for you. I also recommend that you have an advisor or one of the advisors who will lead the meetings so that you mm-hmm. can be totally freed up. You don't have to worry about what time is it now? Are we you know, getting through our agenda? Because then you, you can be the deep thinking. You want to do the be, deep right? dive, yeah. right? You want to do all of this. And um, <clears throat> so you want to have someone who leads it, who understands how to lead a group of advisors. So again, finding the right advisors is very important. Um, what you will hear all the time is you want to bring experts. That's fine, but again, I'm going to go back to the one or two advisors who should bring that 360-degree view Mm. of a business, who understand how to connect the dots for you um, in every decision or issue that's being discussed so that it's not just, you know, and I'll give you an example of... um, a client that we worked with, and we came on board after this happened as um, as a CFO, not, not advisor, but as a CFO. This company was very driven, sales driven, and was had very aggressive sales forecasts that the sales department needed to accomplish. So they went ahead, and the salespeople, you know, were driven to get to that quota, ta-da, ta-da, and um, told operations, okay, here is the pipeline, and it's this fat. You better get ready. So operations says, oh, my gosh, we got to create a second shift. This was manufacturing. Huh. We got to create a second shift. We got to hire people. Otherwise, we can't produce what you're just doing. They did all that, right, uh, in a very timely manner, actually, um, only to find out that the sales did not come through. And what happened there is this uh, was actually in California where where, uh, the the manufacturing company was producing the product. And um, they had to fire, let go all the people, and they were sued by the state. So long story short, this was over a million dollars of a loss. So plus bad publicity and just the plus, scars for exactly, employees and, morale and, and exactly. So if you'd have an advisor or a CFO or someone in the company would have said, "Hold on, how are these sales uh, confirmed? You know, what are the steps, and when do we get into that? You see what I mean? So you bring in operations, you bring in marketing, all those pieces, and I found that in working with tech companies. Huge issue. They, they don't talk to each other. And sure. I actually have a chapter in my book. Well, they don't even speak the same language. No, exactly. Work horizontally across departments mm. uh, because they don't. So that's what can happen when you don't connect the dots. Um, so it, that's that was a huge loss for that company. I think also an advisory board to the business owners listening, um, it makes you more competitive um, it keeps you moving towards your goals and holds your feet to the fire. Mm. Because at the end of the day, when you're in charge, no one ever says, oh, did you do this that you said you're going to do? Uh, did you meet your goal or do you tweak it? An advisory board in a, in a supportive role can be there to constructive say constructive criticism. Constructive criticism can be there and say, 
you know, you need to do this. You need to fire this person now. You've been talking about it for months. It needs to happen now, so let us know when you do it. And that's what I call, you know, holding your feet to the fire. It's actually a fantastic thing for a thing for a CEO to do when when you allow that to happen because good things happen out of that. I think about it for myself for the advisory boards that I'm on is we will sit down at the beginning of the year and we'll talk about what are the plans for the company, what are our goals, what we're going to do, and we expect to see progress updates. We expect to see how we did at year end as we do the next year's strategy. And uh, if you don't have anybody doing that, if you're not being held accountable, you're just not as likely to hit your goals. It's just the, exactly. the way the world works. Exactly. And okay. you're, you're always exhausted and tired and you're just going to pat yourself on the back and say, okay, I did my best. Well, when we when we look ahead, so we've been looking at your career and your trajectory and growth over time and where you are now, and as you project ahead and you think about perhaps the future of advisory boards, do you see any changes on the horizon? I would I would think so. There's a lot of talk about um, the future of and what that would look like. Um, I think it definitely needs to be more diverse. These mm. boards need to be diverse, whether it's a, bo- a board of directors or advisory boards. But we have a lot of data on um, on board of directors. I would say, being a woman myself, I stress forty to fifty percent of women being women being on that board. It make it makes all the difference. And to me, diversity is more than just gender. It's, a it's economic background, international perspective. I'm probably the tallest board member anybody ever have. Height adds in, you know. <laughs> That's right. I, I was just going to add that because <laughs> when you um, when you look at public companies and the way they are put their boards together and the people they have there, so it's a large company, and they only look for people with large company expertise. Well, I think that's a mistake. Why not have someone from a startup? Large companies have huge issues with innovation and innovative thinking. Well, if you bring all these people who've run billion dollar companies, they're going to bring you that thing just the way you do. That's great. But maybe a startup advisor would have a different approach. I think that's a very interesting perspective, and we had one example of that before. So Gordon Hall is the chair of one and the lead independent director of another two public company boards. And he was talking about how he thinks he – there's this dichotomy of somebody who wants to be in a public board where you can't get on one until you've had been on one before. You have to have that experience. And his view is I always want one board member who's brand new, younger and hungry, will read the entire thousand pages for every board meeting because right. they're going to ask the questions the rest of us in the room forgot to ask because we've been with this company for a while. Right. And I think what you're getting at is that same sort of idea from a different perspective. You want different thought process, diversity of thought, right? So that's Exactly. And sense. different expertise, yeah. thought and expertise. Yeah. And um, just to go back – to uh, women on boards, um, in 2017, corporate boards held 21.7% of women. So it's still very low, even though we're... So they met that 2020 target just by a little bit. Right, yeah. right. But, but of course, that's only... There's the difference of doing it for the S&P 500 versus, say, the, the larger Russell number. Right. So there's still more to do. And even at the boards, you know, the one that I was president of, I made a commitment to myself that I wanted more women... So currently we have four women out of 10. So that's the 40% that's great. right there. And it changes the conversation. Sure. It changes things. And only for the good of the organization, in my opinion. Well, Cheryl Batchelder, who's been a very accomplished uh, director, was explaining to me, she said, when I joined my first board, I was the only woman there. And suddenly there were never any more conversations about, and most of the people on the boards are on multiple boards. They would talk about how, you know, no more martinis at lunch now. Uh, certainly nothing like strip clubs or anything like that. She said that suddenly the level was raised just by having different perspectives in the room. Right, right. Yeah. And um, another thing that I see as as the future and, and a need um, of that type of leader is what I call a collaborative leader. Mm. Um, that's a different style. So if you if you look that up, a collaborative leader invests time to build relationships, handles conflicts in a constructive manner, and shares control. So I, when when I in my past would work very closely with CEO and business owners. Um, sometimes they would give me a lot of pushback of, well, you know, um, 
I don't really want an agenda. I don't really want to have goals and objectives. You know, it, it takes away from the mission if they were a nonprofit, or it takes away from the creativity if they were a startup. Um, and I would always sort of use the idea of a jazz musician. I happen to like jazz. Um, I'm the jazz leader. I'm going to give you a bunch of um, uh, co uh, chords to play in, right? And then we play together. We make music together. But I also allow you, Alexander, to play the trumpet and have your improvisation and make the whole piece better. Mm. And that's how I view collaborative I like that. leadership. That's great. Well, Rudy, this time has flown by. And as I think about how we bring all of these amazing disparate sort of pieces of information together, what parting advice would, would you have for someone who's a new or aspiring advisory board member? For um, a new member, I would say make sure that you really understand the difference between a board of directors and an advisory board. We talked a little bit about it. They have a very different purpose, and you may fit into one a little bit better than into another one. Um, on the side of advisor, just because you uh, use the name advisor does not mean it should be informal. Um, mm. There is a commitment that should be made on both sides, of course, the company right. and the advisors. But you make a commitment to do the research, to do the work, then show up at the meetings, and then follow up with the action items. And most importantly, you have to be financially fluent. You have to bring that to the table, that understanding what is accounting, what is finance, um, the decisions we're talking about, can, can the company afford it? How are they gonna finance it? You, ha you have to understand a good amount of finance to, to make a difference. Now, again, I'm biased as a professor of finance, but I agree. And, and we've got your book here, and I know you've got a special offer that you're going to extend to the listeners on the podcast in order to get their hands on that, right? Yes, I'm, I'm very excited about that. It, it's available on Amazon, but if you use the code Gordon19, you can actually get it for $10 less. So we will offer the book for nineteen ninety five. And we will link to that in the show notes to make that easy for everybody to pick up a copy of. And I've got mine, which was a great read. And, great, uh, great. You know, I'm just delighted that we were able to have you on the show today, Rudy. And I would just think um, for people who'd like to follow up with you, what's the best way for them to contact you? Um, probably by just sending me an email uh, or they can call me. Um, at a number, or should I give the number? Well, now? we'll put it in the show notes you if you'd like it. to have that. That'd okay, be great. I'm, I'm delighted to put that in there. Some people don't want to be as forthright, but we'll be very happy to right, put right. that in there for you. Okay. And uh, it was wonderful having you on the show today. Thank you for sharing your insights and helping all of us to be more boardroom bound. Well, thank you so much. I, it was really delightful. That's it for this episode of Boardroom Bound. I really enjoyed chatting with Rudy Scheiber Kurtz. It was a fantastic hearing her growth and development as a board member, from first being on a nonprofit board, then to a normal board of directors role that we tend to think about, and now specializing in advisory boards. And she was able to break down for us how those are unique and why they're a great fit for some people. For some, they're a stepping stone to get to a regular board of directors role. For others, that's exactly where they want to specialize and play, and that's what Rudy does. We've heard all about that experience today, as well as all about her book. Now, remember to head over to podcast.gordon.edu, where you can get links to all the resources we talked about, including to Rudy's book and the special offer that we have for people listening. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode or any other episode of the podcast, I would so appreciate it if you would open iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or wherever you're listening to this and just take 30 seconds to leave a review and rating. This helps us get out word about the show. So thanks for joining me on this episode of the show. I can't wait to share more stories and strategies from brilliant business minds with you again next week. Remember to keep tuning in to be boardroom bound. <laughs>